Good evening. Welcome to the April 11th meeting of the Edgemont School District Board of Education. May I have a motion to return to public session? Milash second. First, Jennifer second. You're back in public session. First order of business is approval of the March 21st meeting minutes. May I have a motion? Milash one, Doya second. Uh, any questions or corrections? All in favor? Motion passes. Do not have a treasurer's report today. Uh, recognition of community. Dr. Hamilton, you yes. like to start. Yes, thank you. Good evening, everyone. We are in the final stretch of the school year, which also is the launch of the season of acknowledgements for awards and recognition. Uh, this evening, we have quite a few students to celebrate for this distinction in several competitions and their impressive rankings. Uh, at this time, I'll ask Mr. Hosier if he will come and recognize our students on the agenda tonight. And while he's making his way to the podium, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the teachers and advisors for their extraordinary leadership and support with our students that contributed to these impressive results. Thank you, Dr. Hamilton. It is my great pleasure to acknowledge three Edgemont Model UN students, Janice Lynn, Orly Charabe, and Tanasi Nagaldeen, who each received the Award of Excellence at the recent National High School Model UN competition. Congratulations to the entire Model UN team, Model UN advisors, Chris Siri and Jonathan Hansenbrook. Earlier this year, Edgemont's first mock trial team was created by Talia Cohen, Alex Kavakov, Ava Schneider, and Ava Thomas. At first, our team simply hoped to attend the competition to have enough members to uh, participate in the county tournaments. I'm pleased to let you know that not only did they participate, but they finished second. They went to the championship round and lost by only half a point against a well-established flying boat team. They well exceeded expectations and are already talking about next year's tournament. So I wanna congratulate them and acknowledge the parent coaches, Lisa Schneider and KP and Carolyn Federer. Congratulations to our mock trial team. Our science scholars programs had tremendous success over the last month. 21 students earned awards at the West F Science Fair. 18 Edgemont students qualified for the Genius Olympiad competition in Rochester in June, the most of any school in New York State. The following students won awards at the New York State Science and Engineering Fair on March 27th. Edward Major, Ryan DeLaw, Bella Jabor, and Alessandra Zangan Karian. At the March 18th Westf competition, Nova Wayne became a finalist for the Regeneron ISEF competition. And if you don't know, it's important to recognize that this is one of the most prestigious awards that science scholar students can uh, achieve. Ami Jane and Nova Wayne each earned first place awards. Rania Malik received a second place award. Ronik Malik earned a third place award. Fourth place awards were won by Michael Barron, Bella Jabor, Jack Liu, Yancey Boone, Albert Lee, George Ishak, Edward Major, and Anisha Moosti. The following students also received awards at WESF. Raman Ahmed, Mariam Kim, Vivian Wong, David Barlow, Daniel Lee, Rajan Sandhu, Jia Singh, Augie Kai, and Jana Shrestha. We have a total of 18 Genius Olympiad finalists, including Jack Liu, Raman Ahmed, Ryan Malik, Augie Kai, David Barlow, Daniel Lee, Advet Palve, Vivian Wong, Nova Wang, Yancey Foon, Alex William, Anika Fadabaraman, Albert Lee, Bella Jabor, Edward Major, Ayan Barnwall, Ranjan Sandhu, and Anisha Musti. Congratulations to each of our Science Scholar students and to their Science Scholars advisor, Talia Dardis. I also want to acknowledge three students who are recognized in the 2023 National Scholastic Art and Writing Awards. Blake Feinstein and Derek Sun received silver medals, and Jean Lim received a gold medal. 
Blake, Derek, and Jean will be honored at a ceremony in Carnegie Hall in June. Congratulations to Blake, Derek, and Jean on this great honor. A lot of great news to share, so we have two more in the bear room, please. <laughs> EHS sophomore Lee Wang won first place in the ninth and 10th grade division of the annual Lifting Up Westchester Student Essay Contest. Lee wrote the prize winning essay about issues of homelessness and mental health. Lee was honored at an award ceremony on March 25th, at which time Lee received an award of $500. Congratulations to Lee and to their English teacher, Liz Scott. Asa Miller is a student in the Edmont Science Scholars Program, and his project is focused on coral reef restoration. Asa's film, Coral Reef Restoration, has been named a finalist in the 2023 International Ocean Film Festival Student Competition. Asa's film is one of nine from high schools around the world, and only one of two from the United States that will be screened at the Fort Mason Center for Arts and Culture in San Francisco, San Francisco later this week. Congratulations to Asa. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hosier. Just make a comment. I would just like to make a comment that I'm very impressed by the breadth and the of the of the awards. It's not just winning in one category, but from STEM to writing to video to Art, it's like to law, it's it's just it's just fabulous. So I'm very impressed by the trend. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there any member of the public who has indicated that they want to speak? Okay, good. We'll move on then. <laughs> um Dr. So, Hamilton, would you like to uh, take acceptance of gifts? Yes. Uh, tonight, the board is asked to accept the following gifts. Edgemont PTA for $2,790 to Sealy Place for Nature's Classroom Experience. Uh, the Edgemont PTA for $500 to Sealy Place for Liberty Balloon Company Experience. And the Edgemont PTA for $6,700 to Sealy Place in Greenfield for the sixth grade trip to Chelsea Piers. Also, the PTSA has supported the following grants. Uh, the CNC, our computer numerical control machine for STEAM, uh, with STEM for $2,900, Renegade's trip for eighth graders for $2,000, and International Day expenses to $2,500. Great, can I have a motion to accept these gifts? Yeah. Marikita, Jennifer, um, any questions or comments? Uh, all in favor? <laughs> motion passes. The board would like to thank the PTA and the PTSA for their continued uh, generosity to our students. Okay, um, on to the board president's report. Uh, Doya and Grace are Grace. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we. Have, uh, so at our last meeting, we had six policies that were presented for um, first readings. Five of those six. Uh, there were no further edits to, no further comments. So I suppose that means we're putting them up for second reading and approval. So mm -hmm. so, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, and those five would be the use of district credit card, reimbursement for conference attendance, um, fixed assets policy, opioid antagonist policy, and the Edgemont transportation policy. So those are just going to be moving forward without and further And facilities use? Facilities use had some change requests and suggestions which we incorporated and so I think Doya is going to just point out what those changes were yes you want to know I'll do lunch you want to do lunch <laughs> okay I'll do some <laughs> um nothing major we did get some meaningful comments um that we went back and reincorporated so the first was we just cleaned up the definitions of the tier one and tier two organizations tier one really being those traditional largely volunteer based um, student focused organizations that are very much aligned with our district mission. Tier two really having always been about the athletic programs that provide really complementary training to a substantial percentage of our students. Um, we didn't call it specifically out as such. And so we just revised it to make it much more clear that tier two is about those athletic programs. Um, important in that the athletic program reservation process is going to be slightly different given the demand on those uh, very limited athletic spaces. 
Uh, the other change we made was um, we had formally lumped into tier three, both adult district-based requests. That's not how I wanna phrase it. Um, requests from uh, request unit space for the purposes of adult programs for district residents. And we had lumped that in with non-district requests as well. Recognizing that we don't exactly want to disincentivize district residents from creating organizations and using those facilities if it, if it really benefits our community. Mm -hmm. And so for that reason, we separated tier three into two separate tiers. Now tier three really being district use for adults, you know, adult programs right? and, and charging them more of that wear and tear kind of fee schedule, recognize that we don't want, again, disincentivize their usage and benefits them. And then really reserving the revenue-based fee structure and policy for out of district requests, right? Meaning that yes. that is where we're comfortable kind of being in line with what other districts are charging for facilities use. Um, and leaving it there. Other than that, we did opt to take out, we had a list for a while like that kind of highlighted who were some of the tentatively approved organizations and we opted just to take all that out because we don't want to keep that list updated on an ongoing basis here, which is that on the district website. Okay. Uh, do you feel that the changes, we can still vote on it today? Or do you feel like the changes were so substantive that I need to leave it out there. Okay. okay. All right. Do you agree to it or no? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Oh, sorry. So I'm also, I'm, there's one more policy that's on the agenda tonight, and it's a new one. Um, it's the uh, our the district's policy on free and reduced price lunch and prohibition against shaming. And what this does is it outlines the contours of the school, the district's lunch program, um, including how to set up accounts and that kind of thing. Um, for the buildings where we offer food service, which currently is just at the high school, but we hope for better um, in, the, um, in the elementary schools. And it also, the prohibition of, against shaming is so that we recognize that kids need proper nutrition in order to engage fully in their education. And this is um, just, it makes explicit that no kid should feel or experience shame if they, for some reason, don't have money on their account balance in order to pay for their meal that day um, and, and the ways in which that we can resolve the, the, the discrepancy. Um, and I wanted to thank Amy Maselhi who um, spearheaded this policy and provided a lot of feedback and conversation so that we could get it to the right place. Um, I would encourage everybody who is interested in lunch to provide feedback on this because your kids are the ones here who are experiencing and going through the process of paying for lunch every day. Um, and I also just wanted to note, because we hadn't said this before, but these policies are available on Board Docs, which is a platform that you can reach through the district website if you go to the link for Board of Education. Um, and so review it there. And if you want to provide feedback, you can email us at boe at edge mm -hmm. OK, that's it. That's Just for point of clarification, those the policies that you're speaking of now are not under policies yet. Right. They will be found on the agenda for tonight's Correct. meeting and they can download them there. Correct. So that the works work in progress you'll find on the agenda tonight. And any policies that you'd like to reference for anything else that's already settled, you can go to our policy link on the board docs platform. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all both for your hard work on this. Um so we have six policies that are up for a second reading to vote on tonight. Is there anybody who wants me to take them separately versus as a group? Okay, so we'll we'll vote on all of them at once. So may I have a motion to accept these six policies? Nilesh first. Second. Uh, Marikita second. All in favor? The motion passes. And just to be clear, that's F1 through six. Yes, F1 through Correct. F6, thank you. Um, so, um, Marikita, would you like to update us on the board sure. committee? Yeah, I'll just give you a quick update because, uh, as you heard in our last meeting, um, we have we are looking back at the bond and reevaluating everything that's in the bond um, based on demographics survey that we got information we got back. 
and some ongoing conversations around needs throughout the district. So I just wanted to let everybody know we had a first round meeting as a, as a bond committee just to go over all of the elements that are um, that are going to be important to consider and to think about kind of the size of the bond. And we're still working towards uh, towards answers on both those things. But the bond committee is already underway, and it was our intention to push forward and have some uh, real information for the public. Um, in the coming months. So that's it. Okay, thank you. I don't know if anybody can bond for the answer. All right, Dr. Hamilton. Yes, on the agenda tonight, you will note that there are two items related to the budget. The first being an analysis of public comments as it relates to foundation aid spending. And the next, a budget update that resulted in a slight decrease in the budget to budget change since our last public report. I'd like to ask Brian uh, Paul to discuss these two agenda items in greater detail. Okay, Can you pull up the slide? Uh, thanks, Dr. Hamilton. So last at the last meeting, we um, discussed the state requirements regarding um, school districts that are receiving increases in their foundation aid beyond a certain capacity. Um, in particular, if you're getting more than 10% um, or $10 million above what you previous re previously received, you need to go through both the hearings, which was held at last uh, board meeting, um, gather public comments, and consider those public comments when making decisions related to uh, budget allocations for the use of the additional foundation aid that is coming due to the district. Uh, this is the second year in a row that we qualify for this, which I'll say it in the positive sense there, because I think it has uh, obviously been the most impactful um, stream of revenue that we've seen change over the last couple of years. Uh, and we also know that this is likely to be the end of those, um, those uh, sharp increases year over year. Um, so what we did in the meantime is we did put a survey out. It was sent out a, a number of different ways. We posted it through uh, board docs on the agenda, we put it in the e-news, the, e the district newsletter that goes out um, in the PTA, I believe also included it in their um, uh, publications via email. Um, unfortunately, we, we only did get 16 responses back. Um, however, it is important to note that the responses did, uh, Jonathan, you can advance uh, actually two slides ahead. Um, the, the information that we did receive does confirm a lot of the information that we've already put into consideration. Um, and so that's a, a welcoming thought. And, and we'll try to articulate tonight um, some of the alignment between the, the 16 responses that we had and a lot of the decisions and conversations that had already been ongoing amongst department heads and principals uh, and district administrators when we built um, the budget. So there were uh, the total foundation aid that we are set to receive, the increase is approximately $1.3 million. And, and we had asked for feedback on the $1.18 million that was not included in the governor's proposal. Um, sorry, that was included in the governor's proposal, but not a part of the set aside uh, that was targeted for uh, grades three to eight interventions. Um, as you recall from our budget presentations right now, we're planning to utilize that set aside money um, for the hiring of a new instructional interventionalist. Um, we don't yet have a finalized legislative budget, although the uh, push from both parties involved is to remove that set aside in the, in the final budget and just have it be a total allocation. So we'll see where that lands in the coming days, um, but we are we strongly believe that that position is valuable um, and something that, that we should consider the use of that money for. So if I just clarify that, mm -hmm. that means that our unassigned foundation aid increase would become 1.31. Total, correct. Seven. Okay. Yep. And you'll see in, in our proposed allocations, it doesn't change because right. the interventionalist is included either way in, in that competition. We, we will use that money that way. That's our, that would be our okay. end of recommendation. Next slide, please. Um, so this just shows the breakdown of the 16 responses. Um, you can see it's mostly parent and guardian. Uh, mm -hmm. We got a few administrators and board members to contribute. Thank you to those at the table. Uh, next slide, please. And this is uh, uh, just a breakdown of, of um, the categories in which um, those respondents indicated uh, they'd like to see us um, consider allocations or additional allocations. The four that I've highlighted in blue font on the left-hand side are the ones that stood out most. And as I spoke of earlier, are really ones that are uh, already aligned with our district mission and our goals and a lot of the considerations that were put into the budget in the first place. Um, in addition to those four that I'll speak about in a moment, you'll see that there was an option to write other. And so we tried to synthesize that information and, and put them into some categories, and they really fell into two groupings. Um, one was really the increasing of allocations related to personnel expenses. So it fell in a lot of different areas. So increased instructional time for the extended school year program, which directly relates to personnel expenses. Um, 
the hiring of certified reading instructors and evidence-based reading methods, teacher aides, um, allocations for teacher aides to provide support outside of the traditional school hours, um, and a consideration of a DEI consultant. And the second bucket uh, that we identified was increased allocations to programmatic initiatives, such as hands-on science activities at the elementary level, the establishment of a district-wide goal for reading achievement, uh, world language programs at the elementary level, and enriched opportunities for elementary students. We have the next slide, please, Jonathan. So as we break down those four that I had written in blue font, um, the first of which is providing supports for students uh, who are not meeting or at risk of not meeting state learning standards and core academic subject areas. And of course, this is near and dear to everything that um, really came, came true in the budget defense process. It is about students and it's about learning. Um, and so everything that was defended along the way really serves that mission. Um, we've identified some areas here where without this additional foundation aid, we would not have been able to make the same allocations without reducing from other areas along the way. So first and foremost is the instructional interventionalist. And so um, although that position is likely to come at a cost of roughly $200,000 when you factor in salary benefits and all other um, expenses, um, only 143,000 is currently allocated to that set aside. The rest of that would have to be picked up by additional uh, foundation. Uh, the adoption of a new MTSS as the multi-tiered systems of support. Um, software platform Panorama, which we learned a lot about through the budget presentations at a cost of $33,275. The adoption of a new phonemic awareness and phonics instructional program, Hegarty, at approximately $12,000 and partnering with consultants to support instructional instruction and interventions. And I've listed a number of them and you'll see they're all acronyms. And if we refer back to um, Dr. Bobbles had given a, a wonderful glossary of, of our terms back in her presentation. We've mentioned them a lot, Amplify, Math and Focus, Science 21, SOMOS, which is a um, uh, world language um, learning platform. That's what I say, maybe. Um, STAR, which provides student data through benchmark assessments and, and a number of other opportunities uh, to the tune of about $25,000. Additionally, um, one of the areas, another area highlighted both by the community and um, certainly comes through in our own conversations in budget planning is addressing student social emotional health. And I think maybe most critical to that is that we know that unless students and faculty and staff feel safe, then, then you can't learn. Um, and so we are investing funds as related to safety and security in a number of different ways, but most notably uh, through new instructional, uh, sorry, non-instructional positions at all the schools and security personnel, um, adding a security personnel at each of the elementary schools um, and kind of changing the model at EHS um, with our personnel structure that we have. Uh, we've allocated approximately $180,000. And then we've listed a second time Panorama because Panorama really does um, meet a broad range of goals for the district. Um, both hitting on the instructional aspect, but also in identifying um, some triggers or issues as it relates to social emotional health of students as well. The third point uh, that came up often in this uh, survey was providing adequate resources to English language learners, students with disabilities, and students experiencing homelessness. Um, and I think that the simplest way for us to identify what the increase is here is actually in indirect special education supports. Um, where we're able to support about $57,000 in increases in conferences, which directly relates to training, and then hopefully we'll have a trickle-down effect to more direct um, supports, supplies, consultants, testing, and membership expenses. And then lastly, and I think maybe most important to our budget, um, but I think maybe um, that should say four, not five. Uh, fourth, in terms of um, prioritization here, um, because it, it's less student-focused and more about our capital needs, um, but one of the areas that we know and we've discussed a number of times is, is the area to reinvest in our, our facilities. Um, and we're doing so with, with real intentionality, both through our work at reimagining a new bond, um, but also in the investment in a transfer to capital this year um, to approximately $2.4 million. And so if, although where money comes in and where it's spent is not always perfectly aligned, what we're trying to do is actually target that total dollar amount. So of the $2.4 million in those proposed transfers for the Greenville Tennis Court restoration, Silly Place Window uh, replacement project, and the Greenville Library Window uh, project, uh, approximately $900,000 of that um, can be attributed directly to this foundation and support that we're receiving. So our, our next steps in the process is, um, it's really twofold. 
So next week, and I'll speak to this, uh, we do have a meeting on next Tuesday uh, where the board will be asked to adopt our, um, our administrative proposal for a budget. In the adoption of that, um, we are including these aspects and considerations that have been involved. If approved, we will post this information on the district website um, that kind of outlines what our planned allocations are. And it's just a plan, like our budget would be in itself. Um, and down the road uh, from the business office, we'll fill out a survey um, that the state will provide to us that asks us how we intend and plan to uh, allocate these resources. And they'll ask for some confirmation that we have it up in public places. When was our hearing? When did we collect data? Uh, and what the responses were like. Dr. Hamilton, I'll pass back to you. If there are any questions as relates to the funding sources? Okay. Um, any questions? So, one, is there a sunset clause for these increasing foundation that they like does it kind of roll off at some point of time in the future? For the foundation aid, it's an increase. This increase will it roll off? That we will not see an increase like we saw this year. I feel very confident in that. It's very few things I would say about the state that um, the crystal ball towards. But what I know is that now that we are getting to what is quote unquote fully funded, um, be the foundation aid formula, I would anticipate our increases to be very nominal. Um, we will not see a, a sharp increase like this year over year. The only way that that would happen is if they totally change the formula, which I know that in the governor's proposal for the budget, there is additional funding uh, for um, the creation of committees to look at foundation aid. However, I think when, when you think of restructuring and looking at foundation aid, it could go one of two ways. It, it could go up or for it stay flat or go down. Um, I, I see the way that the state is borrowing to produce this foundation aid could be an indication of um, future resources being more strained than, than they might be right now. And second is, uh, do we also have to do any kind of performance analysis later on? Hey, you kind of decided to spend on these, but then what's the impact? Yeah, that's a, a good question. I can't remember, and I'm looking to Amy right now, wondering if she recalls, so many of the surveys that we do complete for the state, they ask us a second time later. So it's almost like plans and actual plans and actual. Yep. I can't recall um, if the state has asked us to look into our actual expenses versus planned expenses. Um, my guess is in this, it, it would be, a, it's a no, but I don't want Thank you. Any yeah, other questions? All right, moving on with the superintendent's report. Um, before we get to action items, I just wanted to provide the board and the public with a quick status report on the athletic ad hoc committee. As you know, um, I developed this ad hoc committee several months ago, and the committee is to be commended for their exceptional work and commitment to the process. We've had a steady commitment and attendance of folks who committed to this process. The purpose of this committee was to bring in various perspectives to help us take a deeper look into what opportunities may exist that will provide the framework for developing a corrective action plan to help enhance our athletic program and create greater collaboration between district and various community-based sports programs and teams. Uh, the committee was scheduled to have four meetings. Uh, we have our last and final meeting later this week. And so far, we have identified a few buckets for the district to consider. And at our final meeting, we will bring this all together and ensure that all voices have been reflected in this process. The first bucket is the need for the district to establish budgetary commitment to the athletic program in order to ensure that it is supported in a way that provides the resources for all elements of upkeep, maintenance, uniform replacement, et cetera. We ultimately unpacked the idea that pay for coaches was not identified as a barrier to recruitment and retention. And the fact of the matter is the pool simply isn't large enough. The second bucket was establishing an opportunity for communication and collaboration with all coaches and advisors to help create a pipeline for identifying student talent and accessing those students. Another bucket was bringing some student voices into the conversation to help understand the perceived burdens that student, the perceived burden that students face when trying to be a good athlete and a good student. There is a perception that the pressure for students to be so academically astute sometimes compromises their ability to devote consistent time to their sport. Uh, the next bucket in, involved a closer look at establishing a program philosophy and expectations that serve as the barometer for how we recruit, support, retain, and evaluate staffing coach. And lastly, there are some discussions about contemplating two teams, an AB team for those who want to participate in the sport versus those who want to commit to becoming star athletes. 
it is understood that there are some barriers regarding the size of that district and the availability of space. And lastly, unless something else services in our last meeting, I intend to bring all coaches together, community and school to share the final findings of the ad hoc committee and next steps. Um, so I hope to be able to report out, uh, not next, maybe by next week, I'll be able to have a report prepared uh, that surmises our final meeting and ultimately an action plan uh, for moving forward. And if it's all right, um, unless there are any questions on that, I'd like to move on to the action items. We actually have to do the budget. Oh, you're right. Sorry, apology. <laughs> sorry, you have to do both. And I, I took questions for two. You did. I'm sorry. I jumped in too soon. The, the, can I just say one thing about this? Because I yes. think that, you know, this has been kind of a little bit of like an underlying hum about athletics <laughs> for a really long time. And so I really appreciate you taking it by the horns and really kind of digging into both the community and inviting the coaches and, and everybody kind of in the, in the, on the staff side to really group problem solve. And I think it's, I, I think we're going to come up with some really interesting things. So yes. thank you for. Uh, thank you, Madam Yeah, I'm sorry, Brian. Go ahead. That's okay. Uh, so the, the second item on the board is just an update to the um, the proposed budget. And this is our final um, updated proposal, short of anything happening at the state level regarding um, foundation support or state aid support um, be in the next week or so before adoption. Uh, this will be what the, the final proposed budget is. And, and the subtle changes that are coming to play really relates to our conversation about the bond uh, that Marikita spoke about recently. Um, the... Um, with us abandoning our position on the current bond and looking towards the creation or redefinition uh, of a new bond um, proposition next year, we have outstanding debt that is tied up right now in a bond anticipation note. That bond anticipation note um, in totaling $3.8 million was taken out two years ago uh, to pay for the soft costs associated with testing, design work, architectural and engineering fees. To date, we've spent approximately $2 million of that $3.8 million, and um, it is set to come due May 1st of this year. Um, if, if we were proceeding as planned with the bonds as constituted, we would have done something with that uh, $3.8 million at the time it came due. Either we would have rolled it over up to another year by either adding additional monies to it or leaving it at the $3.8 million or we would have looked to secure long-term financing through the sale of bonds. Um, without a, a bond to act on, we are prepared to close out that $3.8 million ban. In doing so, we have, we've spent 2 million and we have 1.8 sitting right now in our funds. So we would return the 1.8 million and you'll see on next week's agenda, a number of transfers that will position us to be able to make the payment of the remaining balance when that, that ban does come due. Without a ban payment um, in the budget for next year, I had a look at the uh, tax cap calculation. Because a ban payment is part of debt service, it's part of our ex capital exclusions, which meant that we could have added whatever our anticipated ban payment was directly to the tax levy. And so without it, it would be disingenuous for us to go out with the same uh, property tax recommendation. So I've removed the $107,500 from the budget, both on the budget line and in the property tax uh, levy that we'll be asking for um, and to produce a final number. And you'll see for each of the board members who was part of the finance committee, I gave you a, um, a packet of all new replacement sheets that will replace the ones that are currently in your binder. For those that are not in the finance committee, I gave you copies tonight. That's what this large packet is. And Jonathan, if you could just bring up that, that PDF that I shared with you. And if you could just zoom in. So you'll see down in the bottom right, the, the numbers that you see in yellow are the, the lines that have changed. And this is available on board docs as well. Um, so it's just a straight reduction on the property tax levy by 107,500, which reduced the total estimated revenue by 107,500, which in turn reduces our budget to budget and levy to levy increases to rounder numbers like 3.5% on the budget to budget and 3.4% on the tax levy. Next week, um, after uh, the board votes to adopt uh, a, a proposed budget, the next agenda item will be the property tax report card that will also be adopted, uh, which will include uh, the data that, that comes directly from this report. 
Are there any questions regarding the reason yeah. why we had to reduce that or, or the rationale behind that? No, so the rationale is clear. I'm just wondering, are there any second order impact on something related to say interest on like lower cash that you might have? No, I mean, we, we won't see, I mean, we'll see a nominal difference in terms of what, if, if we had had money in for another year, we would wait for an additional interest on that. Mm -hmm. uh, but the offset yeah. of the um, interest paid by assuming that debt in the future, uh, this really positions ourselves to reduce what our, our future debt service will be um, by, by paying off this as a short-term loan as opposed to a long-term um, uh, extrapolated cost over many years. Got it. And does the lower debt burden has any implication on the rating for the school bond? No, no, no nothing of this substance. Ban is well, not kind of material. No, not that I can anticipate. No. Okay, thank you. Uh, and just, Brian, sorry, no, you go. <laughs> you're gonna, uh, you're gonna do it much better than I could. So you you said this last time, but people who were not tuned in last time, could you please give a brief explanation of the anomaly of the tax rate change? Sure, certainly. So you'll see that the uh, anticipated tax rate changes a negative 3.16%. That has nothing to do, um, that, that does not indicate or would one assume that that would mean that your taxes, uh, your school taxes would be reduced next year. That is really, um, uh, really just a function of the fact that the district has been reassessed at a higher value. And so with the assessment of the overall property value of the district going up by, and I forget now, but it's hundreds of million, yeah, $190 million, um, the, it, it's just inversely proportional to. So as that goes up, the 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 change in the tax rate is going to go down. I think the way I've been trying to say it is that if your assessment um, proportionally has remained the same with all assessments in the district, you will see your your levy um, your school taxes increase by approximately three point four percent on the levy to levy increase. But everybody's has changed differently and has a different um, proportional effect on the whole. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my, I was just going to comment on the fact that because we um, take out debt service prior to determining the tax levy, this particular change doesn't actually impact our longer term ability to raise future taxes. Correct. So, yeah, in, um, ish. Ish, yeah. But I'll say that this is the best way I could say is that um, in the tax cap calculation, because we both take out last year's capital exclusions and then add in this year's capital exclusions, it means that those monies that we're taking out and adding in are not affected by the percentage increase mm. year over year. So the 2% cap, for lack of a better uh, way of describing it, is going to continue to hit the excluded money, sorry, the included money without those capital exclusions as a part. And then subsequently, if, if we were to have a large capital exclusion, the, the tax levy can increase by a far greater percentage because that can be added um, without restriction to that. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Anybody else? Thanks, Brian. Thank you. And now we can move on to the consent portion of our agenda. It is the recommendation of the superintendent that the board approve the following items by consent vote. Personnel items H1 through H7, which includes hiring of building-based substitutes, appointments and resignations, Student Matters I-1, Committee on Preschool Special Education, Committee on Special Education Report for the Board to arrange for the programs and services as recommended for the remainder of the 22-23 school year. And lastly, Business offering Office Matters J-1 through J-22 for the approval of budget transfers, RFP for external auditing services, RFP for internal auditing service, acceptance of bids, authorization to enter into consulting agreements, approval of health services, merger of various sports teams, chairpersons of registrars for the 2023 annual budget vote and school election vote, extension of non-residents under special circumstances, authorization to enter an inter-municipal cooperative agreement, disposal of obsolete and broken equipment, certiorari settlement, and authorization of new school student clubs. Mm. Um, yeah, I um, okay. uh, just just want to note an item. Um, personnel items are H1 through H6. And H1 through, 
Yeah, eight to seven. So it was just seven. Yeah. Oh, do I have an old one up here? Yeah, that's what I thought. So yeah, that so was I the was late right. edition today. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's oh. that was that's what I thought. So I it, that's all right. So I'm looking at it, I'm going six. So just for clarity, personnel items are H1 through H7, and business office matters are J1 through J23. Okay. <laughs> Okay. May I have a motion to um, approve the consent agenda? Uh, Marikita first. Second. Uh, Jennifer second. All in favor? Yeah, and a comment. Um, and, oh, sorry, <laughs> Let me guess what you're going to say. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just elaborate more. So I was uh, last uh, week, I was doing uh, a college visit for my son and I would go for this college and say, hey, we have 150 clubs. And I was laughing at it. And I was saying, hey, my God, every time I have a board meeting, I have a new club approval. <laughs> every teacher is volunteering for it. So I have four more clubs and I don't know how many clubs are running. But it's so kind of fun because, uh, you know, for, for students, when they go to the college, it's something new. But at Edgemont, we have this tradition of anybody can start a club and they'll get a teacher mentor. And it's just a fabulous kind of benefit that our students have. And I'm glad that teachers step up and students take benefit of this. So I'm delighted and thankful for the teachers who are stepping up for these clubs. And parents, yep. if I may. Yeah. And we've got parents in this one also. So great. Yes, thank you, teachers and parents for supporting the clubs. Now we can go. All in favor. <laughs> it passes unanimously. Thank you all. This concludes our meeting for tonight. Um, our next meeting will be, uh, we'll have a meeting next month. And also one on May 9th. On May 16th, we have the annual budget and the school board election vote. And uh, I believe that's from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. That's yes, in the San Marco gym here in the Phoenix Senior High School. Um, all board meetings begin at 7 p.m., immediately adjourned to exact session, returning to public session at 8 p.m. We look forward to seeing everybody at the next meeting. <laughs> this meeting